I'm going to go first. I'm Al Gaylor, educator in Sandusky County. Uh, Jason may chime in a little bit on uh, this section with OATS. We've been doing a lot of uh, research together, combined efforts. I've been doing different projects and work with OATS as a forage uh, for going on 18 to 20 years now. Um, and just we started to uh, reinvigorate some of the data and start to do some different things here in the last couple of years with some of our research uh, as it's become a pretty popular option for not only guys that have livestock, but also people that are already in a forage production situation and looking to take advantage of uh, another opportunity to produce some forage for sale. Uh, so we've done a lot of different research projects, <clears throat> which I'll get into just a little bit of here in uh, the short amount of time that I have since Jason and I are gonna split this window. And then he's gonna talk about uh, triticale and some other annuals. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about what some of the things we've done in research and what we found and, and how we can utilize this forage. Um, if you would go ahead and put that first poll question up, I've got three different questions. I'm, I'm going to do them all right here at the beginning, just to give Jason and I an idea of uh, the audience uh, and we can kind of know what kind of questions we might expect then or uh, how to tailor some of our information as we talk through. So the first one is just uh, try to find out who, who, out, who out there is raising forages. And it looks like there are uh, several that are for their own livestock. So it looks like we've got quite a few guys that are um, selling forages as a crop, as well as many feeding uh, for their own. Let's go ahead and change to the next question, Mary. And that's one of the neat things about oats, as well as some of the other annual forages, is we can make these suitable for just about any class of livestock. Uh, a lot of our stuff has been geared toward beef production uh, and sheep, but we've got a lot of dairy producers also uh, utilizing annuals in their operations. And uh, when we get into the situation of wet wrapping, obviously we're not usually talking about a scenario for horses, but there are some of this that is very suitable uh, for horse markets for forages as well. It looks like most of our producers on board today are either dairy or beef cattle production. Let's go ahead and pop that third question up. And the, and the reason we want to know what type of crops you're already raising is because uh, some of these systems we've got, uh, especially when we look at the situation of raising oats as an annual forage, uh, complement our row crop scenarios very well when we guys have guys in wheat production that we plant this uh, on wheat ground rather than try to do a double crop bean or anything else. Uh, we found some pretty profitable scenarios utilizing annual forages planted in July or August that then can be harvested yet that fall. And that's exactly what we're going to focus on with uh, this talk on oats here. So most of the guys are raising corn, um, some soybeans and wheat, and a little bit of alfalfa and grass production as well. So feel free to throw questions up in that Q&A or the uh, chat box as we proceed. And uh, Jason and I will both try to answer those as we go. Um, so I'm going to dive right in uh, quickly and try to get to some of the research results, which really show us. Uh, but basically, to give you just some beginning information if no one has experience with growing annuals for forages, specifically oats, uh, what we've learned through research over years and years of trying different dates, and that's one of the things we're still continuing to look at is what is the ideal planting date, uh, what is the ideal planting rate, and uh, what type of nitrogen use do we need. But uh, we, we know very well from experience we need to target right on that August 1st planting date. Um, with a window of about July 25th to August 10th um, if we're planning to bale that forage. Now, if we're going to graze it, these oats, uh, and it doesn't matter if you're using a 
oat type labeled for forage production or if you're using just a bin run typical grain type oat, we can get these to grow well into the late fall. Uh, some of the research from years back uh, when I was in Fairfield County, we had indication that oats were still growing in well into December and it took over six hours of uh, 28 degrees or below before they were completely shut down. And I've even seen a few of them that have uh, kindled all the way through the winter and, and into spring. So they are actually a pretty tough plant. We're not gonna add a lot of dry matter uh, after we get those initial hard freezes, but they will still continue to grow. And uh, so some of our research has been looking at how late can we plant them into the fall and still get enough dry matter there to be suitable for grazing. And we're thinking uh, based on some of the additional data this year, uh, well into September, that we can plant these things. So it might even be possible to fly them onto a soybean field or even drill them in um, after soybean harvest and still have enough material to go out and graze along with that stubble uh, into the fall. Typical seeding rates around 80 to 100 pounds per acre. Um, we have not targeted in uh, to go much lower than that and increase um, our tonnage or to go much higher or do the same thing. Uh, so somewhere right in that vicinity, uh, test weight on those oats is going to be highly variable depending on your seed source. Uh, so you want to look at that. But typically in that 80 to 100 pound range is going to be your ideal uh, for maximizing production. Some management considerations to think about as we're going through um, the, the growing portion with these oats is, well, number one, before we plant or right after before germination consider a burn down uh, for no more than the cost of glyphosate application uh, unless we have uh, some pressure from water hemp or mare's tail or something else uh, difficult to control in the field that we want to utilize for oats just a simple glyphosate burn down uh, will be well worth the investment to control foxtail and some other things that typically can invade uh, that wheat stubble ground as we try to grow these oats. They will come up typically pretty rapidly and canopy over very quickly as long as we have some nitrogen available for them. The picture you're seeing here on this slide uh, does not have any nitrogen on it and uh, we didn't, I didn't find a good picture that shows some of our side-by-sides where we have uh, 0, 50, and 100 units of nitrogen but uh, you can see this picture taken um, 45 days into the planting, there's not a whole lot of dry matter there. Um, that's with zero nitrogen. So we do know that we need some nitrogen there to get these things going. Whether it's put down, uh, typically our format is to apply it in the form of urea uh, and, and put it down right ahead of the drill so that the drill is working it into the ground. And we're, we're targeting that uh, maximum um, amount around 50 units. We've got trials where we have up to 100 units where we show some slight improvements as you'll see on some of my next slides uh, in dry matter, but not enough to justify the extra cost. So somewhere around that 40 to 50 units of nitrogen is looking like it's ideal for uh, maximizing production and economics. Um, another thing we've been looking at in our research is fungicide application. Crown rust tends to be a, uh, a typical problem on an annual basis with not only oats, but a lot of the annuals that are planted in late summer for a fall harvest. So we have experimented with fungicide applications uh, somewhere around that flag leaf emergence stage. Uh, and that gives us pretty good protection and, and uh, really changes the appearance. And I'm sure has an effect on dry matter that our research has not really told us that story yet, uh, but even if, if not, uh, it definitely has an effect on palatability as the crown rust tends to settle in and can almost cover the entire crop as you'll see in uh, one of my pictures here coming up. When we get into the harvest and storage uh, component of this process of growing oats for a forage, um, if you're looking to maximize nutrient content, obviously just like any other grass, uh, you want to do it before it gets into that headed and reproductive stage. We want to still get it while it's in a vegetative stage. If we're looking to maximize um, and, and balance that quality and quantity equation, it's going to be somewhere around 45 to 60 days after planting uh, in the boot stage uh, to really get good tonnage while still maximizing nutrient content. If we're simply looking to maximize tonnage, we can definitely let that plant go longer 
and uh, and we can even let it head out. It, it is 99% of the time a false seed head that does not try to do any grain fill. Um, so it doesn't have any effect on our, our dry down or anything it actually helps the dry down once we let that plant head out. But we do give up uh, protein content and digest digestible nutrients. If you're gonna try to make dry hay with oat forage, um, my best um, advice to you is good luck. I do grow a lot of forage oats uh, for my own beef hay operation and um, about once every three years, I'm lucky enough to get some of them dry, but it typically takes at least seven days of laying and being tedded to where you can put them into dry hay. Uh, so the typical scenario is making baleage with these and just like uh, other baleage, we wanna target that 40 to 50% moisture range. I have had success wet wrapping them lower than that, um, but can't really advocate for that uh, just on account of some of the problems we can run into just like any other hay of wrapping it less than 40% where it will not ensile properly. And uh, we take some, some risks there with the uh, feed quality then. Um, you need to get on it almost immediately to wrap. These, uh, these bales will start to heat and, and break down and change uh, almost immediately. I've let some sit for 12 to 24 hours before and really wished that I hadn't before we got them wrapped. Um, and, it, and it does take a couple of days to get them to dry down enough to get to that 50% stage as well. So we definitely need to be planning for that, especially uh, with unpredictable weather in late October and early November when we may be trying to do this. Here's some sample results, and that's what the next few slides are gonna focus on uh, to show you what we've got uh, as far as expectations. Uh, the picture on the left here, these oats were planted in a trial in 2019 uh, on July 2nd. And remember back to um, 2019 when, um, everything was different in our world because we could not get anything planted in the spring. So guys wanted to try anything they could and were trying to put all kinds of forages out really early in the season, uh, despite what research had told us as far as planting dates. So we did a lot of different stuff at uh, the North Central Research Station in Fremont as well and planted oats as early as July 2nd. And this, this picture is at 64 days. The picture on the right are oats that were planted July 29th in that what we consider the ideal window. And that picture is at 60 days. And you can see, even though there's slightly less dry matter available there on the planting on the right, protein content is significantly higher uh, because we're still in that vegetative state. And if we let this field on the right go a little bit longer, we're gonna continue yet to add more tonnage. Um, so that's just one of the examples that shows us that that planting date, we can definitely be too early. Keep in mind, this is a cool season plant. And uh, so we need to be getting into those shorter days and target that August 1st planting window. Here's what uh, some of those um, studies have also shown us in terms of nitrogen rate and tonnage. And if you look at the uh, column on the left, it shows, uh, and this is um, 92 units of nitrogen, we applied 100 pounds of urea uh, or 200 pounds of urea. And then the one in the middle would be 100 pounds of urea and on the far right, zero nitrogen. So you can see it does have a significant effect uh, that we have to have some nitrogen available, but we're not sure that we can justify um, 100 units of nitrogen or close to that. Uh, and the added cost there for the little bit of benefit we're gonna get to add another uh, tenth or two uh, in terms of tonnage of dry matter. This next one uh, again shows the nitrogen rate and this is at different stages of harvest. So the blue lines represent a harvest at 45 days and the red lines represent harvest at 60 days and this chart is showing us crude protein. So if you look all the way to the left, um, you see the percentage of crude protein available in the forages at this time. So you can see here that the, uh, the nitrogen rate and uh, the, um, how far in that we harvest it uh, definitely has an effect here as well. Uh, we've got a lot more to learn in, in this case and continue to study this over time. But these are July 15th planted oats. Um, you can see as high as 17% crude protein if they have the nitrogen available there to convert to that protein. Uh, but not a, uh, not a drastic difference at 14% on the uh, nitrogen rate that's just half of that. But again, going back to the zero nitrogen rate on the far right, you can see that it's definitely uh, gonna be economically viable to put some, 
some money into nitrogen to make sure that we get not only a crop, but one that's got the, the protein and the nutrients that we're looking for. This chart is on that same field, and this is total digestible nutrients uh, available at both 45 days and at 60 days. And again, with the breakdown of the blue column being 92 units of nitrogen, the red column 46 units of nitrogen, and the green column zero nitrogen. Um, so again, total digestible nutrients uh, is affected. And uh, we, we did see a little bit higher uh, because of digestibility at that 45 day harvest because that plant's still in the vegetative state. And this is an interesting shot uh, here. Hopefully you can see uh, through the center of the screen here where you can tell the boom of the sprayer stopped when we applied the fungicides. And the left side was not treated, the right side was treated at approximately a flag leaf emergence with the fungicide to try to protect that crop from crown rust. And you can see we still get some on the plant even after it's been treated, but significant difference in uh, the health of that plant um, and how it looks. And here's a close up of those leaves of what's treated versus what's untreated. And you can certainly imagine how this affects palatability. Um, typically, if, if offered, especially in my herd, if cows are offered first cutting alfalfa versus either dry or wet wrapped oat bales, they will run you over and knock gates over and anything in their way to get to the oats and they will ignore the alfalfa. Now, when your plant looks like the one on the left, it does make them shy just a little bit, but they will still prefer that uh, typically over alfalfa uh, in, in scenarios that I've witnessed here on our farm. Uh, but we can definitely increase that palatability as well as preserve and protect that nutrient content with that treatment of fungicide. This next chart uh, shows us those July 29th planted oats, and this is uh, a yield with both scenarios of how much nitrogen we applied and the fungicide treatment. So the bars on the left are the oats that were treated with fungicide, and you can see that our highest uh, tonnages, over two tons of dry matter per acre with oats that were treated with a fungicide and received 92 units of nitrogen, just under two tons uh, for the oats that only had 46 units of nitrogen and were treated. And then you go over to the far right and you can see uh, we did have a drop off in production uh, for those oats that were not treated with a fungicide. And we could spend a lot more time going through the economics uh, of this, which we don't have time for today, but I can tell you that we definitely um, can see a difference and it would make sense in most years to apply that fungicide. Um, and then this last slide here that I'm gonna show you is the nutrient value on a dry matter basis with the same thing on the far left, the treated oats and on the, on the right, the three bars are the untreated. And, and this is showing us a dollars per ton uh, of dry matter using calculations borrowed from the dairy industry on the nutrient value to put it into a, a dollar basis. And you can see we actually came out the best with the untreated oats at the 92 units of nitrogen, uh, but this is just one instance in uh, one section of our trial. There's a lot of work to be done here yet that we certainly think we're gonna end up uh, in a better scenario with a little bit less nitrogen and uh, the fungicide application. Um, so pretty interesting data there. I'm gonna let, uh, turn it over to Jason then, and uh, maybe in the instance of time, we, we try to look at all the questions, if there are any at the end after Jason uh, discusses some of the same stuff with uh, triticale and some other annuals uh, that we've looked at uh, over time. So I will stop. Thanks, Al. I'll try to move through this fairly quickly for everybody because I know we're getting short on time. Um, I'm Jason Hartshu, OSU Extension Educator in Crawford County. I do quite a bit of work with dairy, beef, and forages. So I was asked to talk for a little bit about winter annuals and some of their uses, specifically triticale. So I pulled a little bit of history on triticale. Uh, a lot of people aren't overly familiar with the crop. It really makes a great forage crop and actually has some feed potential. It's a cross between wheat and rye. The oldest crosses date back to about 1875, but it wasn't until the late uh, 1900, so about 1980s, that we really started to see triticale take off as a forage crop. Um, they got a lot better breeding 
abilities then and we're able to mass produce seed. It self pollinates like wheat. Um, its uses is cover crops, livestock feed and forage, straw. Actually, there's some use for it in human food because it has a lower gluten content than wheat or rye, and it's a lot hardier than wheat. So to move into the forages, um, briefly cover some research that we've done. We did a project this past year on with three locations looking at harvest and quality of different crops, harvesting at Feeks 10, so they're just as the crops coming out of the boot, versus at Feeks 10.5, so we had different harvest dates based on the variety that was planted or the species. This here is just showing if you look over to the left, it barely catches it, but that's the rye. Uh, wheat in the middle, and then there's triticale over here. So the rye was the earliest harvested crop, followed by triticale, and then wheat. Um, and this is looking at that then at that Feeks 10.5 harvest on the rye. You can see the rye is a lot taller. Looks like we should have a lot more tonnage, but that tonnage can be very deceiving on rye because it doesn't have the leaf content that triticale does. Uh, wheat is there in the middle, and then triticale is over on your right. So you can see a lot of difference in height, but we're gonna see that tonnage didn't actually show up to be quite as significantly different. Really between all species, uh, averaging across those three locations, tonnage was not significant by species, but it was significant by harvest date. So if you look at the 10.0 harvest feeks, 10.0, a yield range from about one ton to 1.31 tons. Triticale did have the top yield across both harvest dates, but it wasn't, statistically significantly different. Um, but there is definitely some advantages, but one thing you really have to watch if you're gonna use triticale is varieties. Um, there's some huge differences in variety potential for yield. Um, and a lot of that has to do with leaf size. But what you will notice is if you wait until Feex 10.5, which is at uh, pollination stage, you get almost another half a ton of forage across any of these different summer annuals. But really it all depends what you need out of them for nutrient value when you wanna harvest those. On our operation, we actually go with three different planting dates, um, planting rye on two of those planting dates and triticale on the other planting date. And the reason why we split planting dates is we're trying to get high quality dairy cow feed and heifer feed. So by using three planting dates, usually we get one window of really high quality feed that we can use for the milk cows and then feed the rest to our dairy heifers. Because you'll notice a statistically significant difference here between crude protein. Uh, we lose about 2% crude protein going from Feex 10 to 10.5. If we would have used more nitrogen in this trial, we probably could have got that 10.0 protein up 15 to 19%, uh, but it still would have fallen on its face down to about 8%, 8 or 9% at that Feex 10.5. It just the rye, the biggest challenge with it is it changes very rapidly. In about three days, the crude protein will go from 19 to 8. Uh, triticale matures much slower. You have almost a week harvest window with triticale, which makes it have a pretty good advantage. Uh, but when you start looking at some of the other things, as it gets later, of course, NDF goes up and energy goes down a little bit. So for forage management, ideally you're going to plant close to that fly-free date. Put a small amount of nitrogen on to increase tillering, a little bit of tonnage. You won't see a difference in crude protein of 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, that fall applied end doesn't affect that crude protein. And then comes spring, you want to put on about 60 to 100 pounds of nitrogen to, to maximize that economic yield and protein balance. Um, typically, the higher the nitrogen, the more protein you're going to get and the higher the yield, but isn't quite always the case. Protein can be close to about 19%. And then harvest in the boot stage for that high quality. Um, if we look at what that plant actually uptakes, this is kind of some interesting work. We looked at phosphorus and potassium uptake per acre across these different varieties. You'll notice that we were hitting a limit here and it's probably why our crude protein wasn't any better and why we maybe even suffered on tonnage. We only applied 50 pounds of spring nitrogen and by Feeks 10.5 we were really close within four or five pounds of that 50 pounds of nitrogen. So we were trying to mine soil nitrogen and in the spring like that, when the soil isn't warm, we don't have a lot of nitrogen cycling. We didn't tie up a great deal of phosphorus across those acres. Um, looking at about five to 10 pounds of phosphorus as P2O5 tied up per acre and potassium about 18 to 40 pounds of potassium tied up. So they're pretty good crops. They aren't pulling a lot of nutrients out of your soils but can make some excellent feed. And they can be a great way to rescue some challenges in the spring, 
uh, 2020 gave us many challenges. This here was a rye field that had a frosting late. It was just about ready to harvest for forage. That frost was hard enough that it would have sterilized the heads, but it made excellent feed. We're able to go in and harvest that still and do a rescue. Another way you can use small grains and rescue your neighbors. Um, this was a wheat field, had a strong wind come through. Took about half the wheat down. You could go in, it was a bit of a pain, mowing it one way. Um, those were actually snapped. They would have never finished maturing properly. Harvested that for silage tonnage and made great heifer feed, even though it's a little more mature than what you'd want for dairy cows. Um, typically, we wanna look at silage or baleage harvest. And then after the field's harvested, if you have a good no-till planter, you have a nice clean field to go into. You're not dealing with all of that biomass to try to plant through. You just have a little bit of stubble left. Um, can work quite well. One of the challenges you have to think about for harvest management is looking at the more tonnage you get, the longer time it's gonna to take to dry. Typically for silage or baleage, you mow one day, it has to wilt an entire day to chop or bale on the third day. Wide swaths are gonna dry the best, but one of the challenges we find is that when you lay it wide and the ground is still damp in the spring, it doesn't dry very well. And if you're trying to pull large silage wagons and silage trucks over it, we actually find it's better to lay swaths narrower or go in and rake on day two to create those narrow swaths. And that helps the ground dry out some, which holds our equipment up a lot better. Um, and that's in both no-till and conventional. I know a few guys say if we just no-till it, we wouldn't have those issues. We plant a lot of our rye conventional. Uh, just depends what kind of mess we make in corn silage harvest. Um, but we have those challenges both on no-till and conventional soils. So narrowing those swaths does help get the ground just dry enough to hold your equipment up. Dry har harvest, a lot of times we look at a four or five day drying window and have to TED daily to get these crops dry. It can be done, we've done it in the past. And the other challenge you may run into is if you think about a small grain, it has a fairly long stem, um, which can cause some feed out problems and a high amount of waste if you don't have any way to chop that bale, either with a bale cutter in your baler or some sort of TMR or bale cutter after harvest before feeding. Um, and I think this is the last slide here on harvest timing to balance quality and yield. Triticale and rye, the ideal timing for those is gonna be in the boot. Wheat, the way it puts nutrients on and the added energy, waiting till bloom stage is a little bit better. Barley, you're gonna wait just a little longer into that soft dough stage. And oats, uh, early seed set yeah, for spring oats, between boot and early seed sets, ideal for oats to balance yield and quality. Of course, the earlier you harvest, the higher quality, but lower yield you're gonna have. But economically to balance those two, those would be the ideal harvest stages. Does anybody have any questions? I tried to go through those winter annuals pretty quick for everybody, um, just to get us back on time and be respectful since we were gonna be done about 10.30. I do have one question here of, do you crimp the material in the swath to increase drying? Uh, yes, so we typically run it through. So one of the challenges some guys have with it is getting their disc binds to pull, the Annuals. rolls to pull in. Um, but if you get your roll set right, sometimes you have to loosen the pressure a little bit so it doesn't clip quite as well. Um, but by using those crimpers, and it definitely does help speed up drying just a little bit.